Should I go ahead? Ready? Okay. All right, I'm going to start. <coughs> uh, thanks for being here. My name is Roy Colvin. I'm a dermatologist. Uh, I'm based at Harborview. And uh, I'm also on the faculty here. Uh, some of you, maybe in your second year of med school, and in the spring, you'll take a skin biology course called The Skin. Uh, I'm the co chair of that course. And so, those of you to that point or, or in your first year, and you're going to take the course next year, you'll, this is a preview. This will put, give you a leg up. It'll give you that honors that you can't get in your preclinical courses anymore. <laughs> Uh, let me get an idea. How many of you are first year medical students? Good number of you. Second years? And then I uh, hear we have also uh, MedEx or PA students. Okay. Any other schools? Any other types? Students? Third and fourth year med students? Dental? Dental? Yeah, okay. Yeah. We're good virtually. Yeah. Uh, did I miss anybody? Okay. So you're all f virtually all first and second year students. Great. So uh, what I'm hoping to accomplish here is just to give you, if nothing else, uh, the words to use when you're describing the skin findings that you're going to be seeing at the Downtown Emergency Service Center. Uh, I, uh, my practice is just up the hill from the DESC, and uh, we tend to sort of make room for any referrals that you all send to us from the um, shelter though uh, those patients rarely get up the hill, <laughs> honestly. I mean, even ones that you call on and say, this guy has got something really bad and we want you to see him. And uh, I'd say about mm, less than 10% of the time those patients actually make it for a daytime appointment. So you realize that the impact you'll have on these patients will, I mean, you will be their providers uh, for, their, for that problem. And, uh, and um, probably the, you know, they're not going to see anyone else like me uh, uh, at another place. So what I want to do is I want to basically teach you a language um, right here in the next, you know, 30 to 45 minutes uh, on how to describe uh, skin lesions. I want you to have an approach to a patient with skin problems and then uh, if we have time we'll go over maybe some of the common skin conditions you'll see. But, you know, in time when you're working down there you'll, you'll eventually get to those. Uh, skin disease is a big deal in this country and all over the world. Uh, I'd say the last point may be the most relevant one for you, and that is that although the skin problem may not be um, killing the patient at that time, it is causing a lot of social morbidity, a lot of stigma associated with it, whether the patient acknowledges it or not. And the other thing is, is that a skin problem also serves as a hook t as an ent to get into uh, the healthcare system. Okay, so often things get uncovered when they present because they can see what's going on. They present to you with a skin problem, and then that's when you discover that a patient may have high blood pressure, or may be diabetic, or may have HIV, or may you know keep going. You know, and they may not have known that, or they may have had some idea that something else was wrong, but they didn't really acknowledge that there was a problem until they develop a skin manifestation. So this happens all over the world, and I've been to other places in the world where. I mean, you can do things like stage HIV from skin manifestations, and you can, you know, the, uh, the skin is what finally gets, you know, that 60-year-old person into healthcare for the first time, and they have internal malignancy or what have you. So it, it, it's kind of a big deal. Cost-wise, it's a huge deal, okay? Uh, it's, you know, the, the cost burden of skin disease is, is, is gigantic. In homeless individuals, there are kind of four aspects that make them uh, a little bit more prone to skin disease, and I kind of uh, categorize them here. Uh, exposure, uh, and that's to environmental factors as well as uh, parasitic factors, for example. You'll see a lot of scabies, and you'll see a lot of, basically, I call them arthropod assault, okay? Uh, ectoparasite or otherwise. There are a lot of bed bugs at the DESC. There's a lot of uh, clothing and head lice. And you'll, and you'll see a lot of scabetic infestation. Um, but also, they're outdoors more. Uh, they, they generally can't stay inside the DESC anyway in inclement weather, so they're exposed to cold, exposed to sun, um, and they often don't have places where they can um, clean up. Uh, 
the tendency for my patients that come to me and also the ones that you'll see is that they tend to wait a little bit longer than maybe you or me or other people who have a little bit more healthcare consumer, uh, whatever you call it, sophistication or you know experience. So they may not run to uh, a dermatologist for a zit on their forehead like that happens in some places. Um, they may let things go a little bit longer. And so things like skin cancers may be a lot bigger than um, you might expect. Uh, you might ask yourself, well, how did this person wait in this long uh, to get here? And there's probably a whole number of reasons that you'll probably touch on um, in subsequent uh, discussions tonight. There are barriers uh, for these patients and you have to understand that. And uh, I always look at it the other way, you know, especially when a patient says, God, I, you know, I know this thing's gone on long enough and I know it's huge now, but I always say instead of what, what took you so long is, well, thank God you're here now, okay, as opposed to five years from now, okay, it could have been way worse. So I try to put a positive spin on things as a, and not, I mean, um, the patient's the one with the disease and you got to remember that and, you, you know, we're not in the position to judge them uh, on how long they waited or didn't wait to come in to see us. Okay, uh, any talk I give about skin disease or dermatology in general, I like, to, um, I like to recall five principles, and there are more than five principles, but um, they, some of them are, are very self-evident. Uh, number one is that skin disease is visual, okay? Um, and this is kind of nice because uh, it, for the most part, in, in almost all cases, it makes you and your patient uh, an instant ally. You can both agree that there's something wrong, okay? In the rare situation where someone is, say, delusional and they believe they have parasites in their skin and you're sure that they don't, that's where things can go, you know, off track a little bit. Uh, but for the most part, you and your patient are gonna agree, yes, there's definitely something there and that's not normal. Okay, and that's, that's a nice alliance right up front. Uh, whereas, you know, sometimes it's harder to convince a patient, you know, you have high blood pressure and you're at risk for, you know, cardiac disease and stroke, and they don't feel a thing. Uh, and all they see is a number on a piece of paper when they come to a clinic. So sometimes that can be a hard thing to convince the patient that there's a problem. Uh, skin disease is relatively easy. Second principle is that skin disease is often more than skin deep. Um, this was a patient uh, who I saw in North Carolina when I was in training. And um, though this looks like it may be a manifestation of maybe sun damage to the lower lip and possibly a sun-related cancer, um, this actually has, ends up being an adenocarcinoma, so not a squamous cell carcinoma, which we'd expect on the skin, or basal cell carcinoma. And it turns out he, this was a metastasis from a lung primary tumor, okay, that he didn't know about until we did a biopsy of this lesion. Um, and then we asked for an x-ray after we got the result. So you got to think systemically when you're approaching your patients with skin disease. Principle number three is that skin doesn't read textbooks. And though you may go home that night and read about psoriasis that we just diagnosed in the DESC, you're going to find, wait a minute, that guy didn't have plaques on his elbows and knees and scalp and the places where the textbooks say. And, and in terms of distribution, psoriasis is one of the most illiterate diseases there is. So common things presenting uncommonly is common in skin diseases. Got that? A lot of commons there. Common things presenting uncommonly is common. Fourth principle, uh, as opposed to all the things you're learning in ICM right now, which is you sit down with a patient, you take a history, you then, you know, go on to do a physical exam and then you put that all together and come up with a differential diagnosis. We do things a little bit uh, sort of bass backwards in dermatology. Uh, I don't like to hear much history before I've seen the patient because I want to form my own opinion based on my visual inspection before I get the patient's ideas about what he or she is dealing with. So here, for example, is and it's not always the patient giving you the history. Sometimes, in this case, this was someone referred to me from an emergency room saying, we have this uh, man who was mowing his lawn and is highly sensitive to poison oak, and he ran over poison oak, chopped it all up, and it got in the air, and now he's got a allergic contact dermatitis from the poison oak, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm armed with that history. I'm going down to the emergency department thinking, okay, well, you have to give him some, you know, 
immunosuppressives and other things for his contact dermatitis, and lo and behold, uh, he doesn't have contact dermatitis. Okay, uh, and how do I know that? Don't look at me; it's up here. Very good. Not, yeah, not only is it not, you know, on both sides of his face, but you identified that it's just one dermatome. And contact dermatitis doesn't do that. Okay, it doesn't restrict itself to one part of the face unless he's wearing a very specific, you know, mask over all the other dermatomes on the face, right? So what is this condition in reality? Yeah, this is actually an infection. This is herpes zoster, a reactivation of varicella. So, my point is, look first and ask questions later, okay, uh, as opposed to getting history. And so, it doesn't mean you're impolite to your patient the first time you see him. You can chit-chat, but start your examination from the moment you enter the room and you start looking at the patient. Okay, even before you start looking, take in all of the sensory clues that you're getting, okay, olfactory, sound, you know, the general appearance of the patient, etc. Uh, you'll pick up a lot of information that way, and then it'll be unbiased. It's just your, your opinion about what's going on, not the patient's or some other provider's. Okay, and the last principle I'll tell you about is that uh, the skin is not just simply an, an inert uh, barrier to keep the desert of the outside away from the ocean on the inside. Um, it's a very dynamic immune um, organ, okay? And um, this will become apparent when you see you know, infectious conditions of the skin and inflammatory conditions of the skin. Um, I really got hammered home for me. I do a lot of uh, HIV-related dermatology, and I thought that most of what I would see in advanced HIV would be opportunistic infections, and that's rare. Um, what I see most of the time are red, itchy patients, okay, from immune dysregulation uh, and not immune suppression. It doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me initially that advanced HIV would have itchier, more inflamed skin than in less advanced HIV or non-HIV infected patients, but they do. And it has to do with the fact that it's not just about immune suppression, it's about immune dysregulation and the skin is an immune organ. Okay, any questions about this stuff so far? Okay, this is, this is gonna get more interactive in just a minute. Okay, so here's my 30 second approach to almost any skin problem, okay? And again, you're taking this information in from the moment you, you step into the room and you see, smell, start talking to the patient. I mean, this, is, this point is basic to any encounter we have with any patient. Is that person sick or well? Okay. And by sick, I mean sick, we need to do something now. Sick, we need to send them to the hospital tonight. Or chronically sick, psychologically sick, you know, socially sick. He's homeless. She's homeless. So you, you're going to make this assessment from, from the get-go. Sick or well, that's, that doesn't pertain just to dermatology. That's all of medicine. You want to break down whether the skin problem is a bump or a rash. And I'll get into that more in a little bit, but uh, I know that sounds like one of those made ridiculously simple books. Um, but uh, it really does boil down to that. I keep uh, the things I consider for someone who has a single lesion presentation in a totally different part of my brain than someone who has a diffuse rash issue, okay? So bump or rash, I mean, you decide that pretty quickly. And uh, most of the patients you'll see at the DESC are rash patients, okay? Occasionally you'll see bump patients, but most of them are rash patients. And it's not impossible to have someone who has a rash going on as well as a bump, okay? That, that does happen. Uh, what colors your skin is really important. Okay, darker skin uh, does not show uh, uh, erythema or redness as obviously as fairer skin. Okay, so you have to learn to see erythema in people who have darker skin tones. And that takes practice. And you'll see the differences uh, when you're working. Though, I, you know, I'd say uh, most of the clients that we see probably are of, you know, fair skin tones you'll see um, plenty of darker skin tones too and be able to compare and contrast. It takes some practice. How old's the patient? That's an obvious thing. Is the situation acute, chronic, or in between? And how is the problem on the skin distributed? Is it all over? Is it dermatomal? Uh, is it patterned in some way that may be helpful in identifying it? And then lastly, uh, what is the primary lesion? Okay. 
And I'm not expecting you to know what this means because that's what the next part of this talk is going to be about. What is the primary lesion? And this is where the language of dermatology comes in. Okay, so primary skin lesions really kind of boil down to kind of a handful of terms. And have any of you taken the uh, visual thinking strategies course? Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, it is. It's really good. I mean, if you, if any of this interests you at all, um, and you see that, and it fits in your schedule, consider taking it because it it gives you a different way to look at uh, at people, patients, and and a lot of things because it incorporates uh, art into the practice of medicine uh, and how do you use your visual skills, something we don't really teach all that much. You guys are learning your first year about how to auscultate, how to palpate, but we don't learn much about how to inspect. Okay, we, it's just a given to say inspect the skin. It's like, okay, you know, that means just looking at it, but you have to kind of know what you're looking for and then you have to be able to sort of put words onto what you're looking at. Um, and so these terms will help you in sort of putting the words to what you're seeing. And then from there, your vocabulary can build. It doesn't have to be restricted to these few terms. But these are helpful. Okay, so uh, a macule or patch are just different sizes of, uh, describing the same thing. Basically a color change in the skin. Something you can't feel, uh, but something you can definitely see a difference of. And usually, not always, but usually you can tell the normal skin from the abnormal skin, okay? <laughs> that isn't always the case. Sometimes uh, there are you know, pigmenting disorders where you're not sure, is the person fairer than this and they're hyperpigmented or are they actually darker? And what we're see the problem is, is the hypopigmentation. So, but for the most part, you can usually distinguish what's the patch. And it can be any number of different colors, okay? Brown, black, blue, red, uh, if you consider tattoos, there's all colors of the rainbows if you want to uh, count them as macules or patches. But a lot of diseases and um, uh, conditions that occur in the skin can be of various colors without any elevation or depression in the skin. Okay, a papule is a raised bump, a small one, okay, um, usually less than a centimeter. And the measurement is not so critical, it's just if you think of a small bump, the instead of calling it a small bump when you present to the attending that night, you would call it a papule, okay? And if it's a number of papules, you'll call them papules, <laughs> plural. And, and, and then go on to distinguish them, how they're distributed, where they're distributed, okay? He's got, you know, monomorphous papules distributed over the back and chest. That's very descriptive. And then if you add what color they are, erythematous or red or pink or brown or whatever, um, that would be, you know, give a very good visual picture to the person listening to your history. Okay, papule. Plaque is a broader, usually flatter, raised skin lesion. Okay, think of plateau when you think of plaque. Okay, and the reason I'm, these terms are not what we use just here in Seattle. Okay, this is what they use in Florida, in New Hampshire, in South Africa, in Europe in Latin America. So these, this language is fairly international uh, and, and so knowing it is helpful in using these skills when you go and practice medicine or help do part of your training in another setting. Nodule is a deeper seated, larger raised or elevated skin lesion, okay? So nodule. Uh, uh, an example would be a cyst on the skin or a lipoma. Okay, um, a vesicle or bulla are basically what you would call blisters. Okay, F clear fluid generally filled um, vessels just based on size, a vesicle is small and a bulla is larger. And again, the, the exact size thing is not that critical. If you said large vesicles, I know what you're talking about. If you said small bulla, I'd still know what you're talking about, even though there may be some overlap in size of those things. But um, vesicles, the plural of bulla is bulle, okay, B-U-L-L-A-E. And pustule, okay, basically the same thing except instead of clear fluid, it is pus filled, okay. Think of a zit, okay, in acne or a pustule in a well-developed um, chicken pox, which starts as a vesicle, by the way. A wheel is kind of a special uh, term to denote an area of, you know, a hive or some people might call it a welt, okay? Uh, 
but a wheel is the um, you know, sort of international accepted term for this smooth, contoured elevation of skin, usually red. Sometimes it's, it's not so red and just raised. Um, and it's generally due to edema in the dermis mostly, sometimes in the epidermis too. Okay. Uh, you're going to get a chance to practice here in just a moment. Beyond the primary skin lesions, there are secondary changes that are worth um, knowing the words for. For example, if a plaque has flakiness or increased layers of stratum corneum, the outer layer of skin on top, uh, we call that scale. Okay? Scale is actually when the skin is sort of peeling away or falling away visibly. Okay? When it's thick and adherent, we give it a different name called hyperkeratosis, but I don't want you to remember that right now. That's something you can learn when you do a derm rotation in your fourth year. When something is flaky, we call it scale. Crust is different than scale. Crust is what happens when serum exudes across the skin or what's left of the skin and forms a scab, okay? You all know what a scab is. Um, you've been picking scabs all your lives. Um, from here on out, you call them crusts. And you can still pick them if you want to. That's up to you. Um, but um, a crust is basically what you have heretof uh, heretofore known as, well, a scab is what heretofore will be known as a crust. Erosion is a place where the skin is partially denuded, not completely through the epidermis. And if you think of a blister that you've peeled away, what's left is an erosion. Okay? All of you had blisters on your feet after a long hike in new shoes. And after that blister pops and peels away, you generally have an erosion. And it's often painful because the skin is, and its nerve endings are exposed. An ulcer is a deeper... Uh, rent in the skin that goes beyond the epidermis, okay? And I'm sure you've all seen this, may have had an ulcer yourself. A fissure is a crack in the skin, okay? And lichenification, probably the hardest one to remember because the name is long, but it uh, invokes a thickening of the skin that is manifested by increased lines in the skin, often with increased stratum corneum or hyperkeratosis. And this is a situation that most often comes about as someone rubbing the same area because it's chronically itchy over and over again for weeks. Okay? And the skin responds become, by becoming thicker and trying to resist that, that, uh, that trauma, like canvication. And kind of the opposite of that is atrophy, where the skin thins from, oops, from various uh, causes. And... Um, and then becomes somewhat depressed. And a scar is a scar. Okay, that is an acceptable term. A scar can be hypertrophic or it can be atrophic, depending on the age of the scar. Often when scars are first forming, they're often a little hypertrophic and raised. And then with time, they often will become depressed uh, and, and indented in the skin. All right, let's practice. This is where you guys need to wake up. Okay, who can give me a primary lesion term for this patient's condition? Primary lesion does not mean diagnosis. I don't care about the diagnosis right now. Go ahead. A patch is a good descriptor, right? And you could even probably identify individual macules. Okay, right? So there's some smaller areas where the skin is... Is the problem the hyperpigmentation or the hypopigmentation? Hypo, okay, right. In fact, in this case, it's depigmentation, okay? The patient has vitiligo and um, something has destroyed this person's melanocytes in these areas. Very good. Patch, right? How'd you know that? You can't feel it. <laughs> Very good. And that's an important thing because your eyes actually see a lot of three dimension, even though you're looking at a two dimensional screen. Uh, and you can invoke, you see or don't see shadowing. You can see a lot of things that um, you know, are, would be impossible to see. So um, we all have 3D vision, uh, even when it's viewing a two-dimensional object. That's why things like um, teledermatology work so well. Okay? We don't have to actually feel the patient in order to be pretty close with the diagnosis. Okay, somebody else. And you can just shout out. You don't need to raise your hand. Primary lesion.
Very good. Who said that? Excellent. Way to go. Okay. And it is a plaque. Uh, there are multiple plaques. Um, and you might be able to find individual papules, too, that are smaller. Is there a secondary term you can give to this plaque? Secondary descriptor? Scale. Very good. Scale and hyperkeratosis. That's right. Uh, any ideas what this condition is? It is psoriasis. So good. You're recognizing uh, a condition that affects 1 to 2% of the world's population. So you as does vitiligo. So um, it's good to know about these things. Excellent. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Let's go with it. I don't remember what this is supposed to be. Descriptor? Primary lesion? I can wait a long time. Well, do you think it's elevated? No, so that boils it down. Is it a blister? No. So you're trying to decide if it's a patch or maybe if it's indented. Um, I think it's a patch. Patch would probably be the best descriptor for it. <clears throat> there may be some scale or hyperkeratosis on it. It also, a, another sort of term that helps add to the richness of the vocabulary is that it's a ring-shaped patch, right? So you could call it an annular patch, okay? Uh, or a ring-shaped patch. You don't have to get fancy with the, just the words you don't use in everyday life. So if you said, you know, I, I'm, I see a red ring-shaped patch on somebody's hairy part, um, that would give me a pretty good idea before going in the room what's going on, okay? So that's a good description. Okay, how about here? Yeah, good, good thought. Yeah, it has that kind of smooth contour. In this case, um, they are not wheels. Um, these are probably subcutaneous and pushing the skin outwards. And so we'd call it a... or call them... Very good. Okay, very good. Yep, these are nodules. These are, these are lipomas. Okay, not inflammatory, they're benign tumors, and they're forming these nodules. Excellent. Easy. Pustule, okay, I'll have experience with those. Okay, very good. How do you know the vesicles? Why not bullae? They're too small. Right, and if you were to be completely descriptive, right, you wouldn't even have to bother me to come out of my cushy office and see your patient by saying, I've got a patient with grouped vesicles on an erythematous base. I would go, well, that sounds like herpes to me. Next patient, you know. So that, I mean, that is such a complete description here, and it's so characteristic of herpetic infections that I almost don't have to see the patient, but I will. Just for you, because you pay for it. Uh, right, so grouped vesicles. How about that one? Ulcer, yeah. In fact, you know, um, it looks like it's not just an ulcer, right? Because beyond the ulcer, what else do you see? There's definitely crust, and there's, you know, necrotic skin, and there's, how about the area sort of above and around the ulcer? Is that normal looking skin? How is it abnormal? Is it flat or is it raised? It looks raised to me too, okay? So you really have probably a plaque within which there is an ulcer, okay? So an ulcer is a perfectly fine description. If you said an ulcerated plaque, that would be probably even more accurate, okay? And that, tell, that makes me think of first there was a growth and then it ulcerated. And when I think about that situation, what do you think about when you hear that? First there was a growth and then it ulcerated cancer. Okay? Something grew, outstripped its blood supply, asphyxiated, became necrotic, and developed this, this lesion. Okay? So I'd worry about this being a skin cancer. Okay? Now, you know, it could be an infection, do the same thing, but in this case I'd worry about um, a ulcerated skin cancer. Okay? Alright? 
what are we seeing here? Secondary description. Scale. Yeah, scale and hyperkeratosis to beat the band. Primary lesion. Scaly papules or plaques. Okay, what's distinctive about this one? They're linear, right. Don't ignore that. I mean, in your description, if you didn't include, and they line up in kind of a line or they're linear, and I went in and saw this, I'd go, did you notice that this was lined up at a line? And you say, heck yes, that was the first thing I noticed because it's so striking. Okay, so don't let those obvious things uh, you know, go by and, and, and so make sure you include them in your, in your presentation. Okay, so linear distribution of scaly papules and plaques, right? And to me, I, again, psoriasis, because psoriasis does this. It does something called kevnerizes, where it shows up in places where a patient may have minor trauma, like scratching or, or you know, whatever. Uh, new lesions of psoriasis show up in that area of trauma. Okay? All right, what do we got here? I'm sorry, you said it, but I didn't hear it. Wheels, very good. Okay, yeah. So you look at that, uh, you think wheels. I think this person also has some striae, okay, or atrophic skin, probably from stretching or maybe from hypercorticalism or whatever. But the center right around that belly button is where you see the best wheels, okay? There's a close up of some more wheels. See how smooth they are? They're almost invariably red, okay. Uh, and generally itchy. So when someone has hives, they're usually itchy. And the other characteristic thing about hives is anyone, ever, you don't have to raise your hand, it's too personal. But any of those of you who have had hives will know that there's another characteristic feature about them, and that is they're transient, okay? So there's really very few things that can come and go within a matter of hours, generally always less than 24 hours, uh, and that's hives, okay? And, and that just nails it. I mean, you, you know that person has urticaria or hives, and then you go and try to find what triggered that. All right. What are we seeing here? See scale, definitely. And erosions, right, erosions. Kind of hard to see, but probably this one is the best example. And this one may be an intact blister or boa, okay? So this is an important point with this, and I think I'm gonna make this my last slide, is that uh, when you see erosions, don't just think, okay, what, what did this to the skin? Think that this could have been a blister first, and then think about what could be a blistering process that would fit with this patient's scenario, okay? So erosions should be considered a blistering disorder until proven otherwise, okay? Erosions are secondary. Um, Bolle and vesicles are primary. And an erosion is simply where a blister roof has just been pulled away or fallen away or scratched away. Some of the bl blistering conditions are so itchy that you'll never see them as intact blisters. Uh, you'll only see them as erosions. Okay, so keep that in mind. Erosions were blisters unless you prove it otherwise. Okay, so any questions about the language? I didn't, there's a bunch of other stuff I didn't cover and I'm not going to go into it because you can only take so much in one go. Question? Curious, what would cause this? What could cause this? Right. Um, well, any number of things. There's some autoimmune blistering diseases, a whole host of them. You'll learn about them in the second year, some of them. Uh, somebody could have a contact reaction that could cause blistering either by caustic mechanism, toxicity, or allergy. Okay. Um, it could be a manifestation of a drug the patient has taken. We get sometimes bolus drug eruptions. Uh, could have been a burn. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks.